whereby we must be saved or can be saved. In the name of Jesus Christ. Turn your Bibles, please, to Psalm 144. We read it responsively a few moments ago. And we're going to look at half of one verse today. And I know what you're thinking. Well, maybe we'll get out in a timely way. We, let's hope so. Let's hope so. Psalm 144, verse 12. I hope you have your Bibles. hope you found that in your Bibles. If you don't have a Bible, we have it on the screen for you. Stand with me, however, as we read this verse. And then I'll tell you what we're going to do today and what Lord willing will do June 15th, Father's Day. Verse 12 says, May our sons in their youth be like plants full grown, our daughters like corner pillars cut for the structure of a palace or a temple, some rendered. This is what? It is the inerrant, infallible, all-sufficient Word of God. Why would we preach on daughters on Mother's Day? Because that's where mothers come from. It's from daughters. Thank you. Be seated. I abducted your girls. I will sell them in the market by Allah. There is a market for selling humans. Allah says I should sell them. He commands me to sell. I will sell women. I sell women. So said Abu Bakr Shakal, the leader of Boko Haram, a Nigerian Al Qaeda affiliate. Why do I read that? He invokes the name of his God. That's why he kidnaps and rapes and tortures and then sells into slavery. How different the language of the true and living God. It offends me for anyone, I don't care who, to place Islam on an equal footing with Christianity. I read to you, we read together Psalm 144 that where there was language of war interlaced in it. But our God who knows how to make war also knows how to love his children and exhort others to protect them and nurture them. May our sons in their youth be like plants full grown, our daughters like corner pillars cut for the structure of the palace. We're going to take the last half of that verse today. And then come June 15th, God willing, when it, it is Father's Day that day, we will look at the first half of this verse about raising godly sons. Today, raising godly daughters. Because you see, motherhood doesn't change everything. And we must, early on, instill in our daughters, in fact, pray for our daughters. That's what this is. May our daughters. It's a, it's a prayer. It's an expression of a desire. Spurgeon says this. We desire a blessing for our whole family, daughters as well as sons. For girls to be left out of the circle of blessing would be unhappy indeed. You see, if you study historically, girls and women have not had a good time of it historically. Even in an enlightened society like ours, like our nation formed in 1776, and independence, and then following that as we constructed what it was going to look like in the, in the Constitution. Even then, women were not allowed to vote. And it could be argued that throughout generations, women and girls have been the most mistreated sector of society. But isn't it interesting that 
though that happens, you read a different tone in the Word of God. You would expect when you look back and see how, how societies and cultures have treated women and girls in the past, that the text would just say, may our sons in their youth be like plants full grown, finished. But no. Spurgeon goes on to say, daughters unite families as cornerstones join wall together. And at the same time, they adorn them as polished stones garnishing the structure into which they are builded. Home becomes a palace when the daughters are maids of honor. The sons are nobles in spirit. Then the father is a king, the mother a queen, and royal residences are more than outdone. He says finally, a city built upon such a city built up of such dwellings is a city of palaces, and a state composed of such cities is a republic of princes. I want us to, uh, to see here in this text this outline. This prayer, may our daughters be first like corners, like corners, like corner pillars, like cornerstones. You may have noticed some architecture, some Greek architecture, particularly either if you've traveled in that part of the world, if you've seen pictures of it, or seen some, some replicas and reproductions in, in the West. You don't find it every time, but it's not unusual to find uh, fair maidens, these, these uh, beautiful shapely women who, who are etched into the pillars, becoming the pillars, as a matter of fact, of prominent structures. It's a fascinating picture. Now, I, I don't agree with Mao Zedong. I'm sure you're relieved to know that. I, but but when, I was, uh, when I was in China, I was able to purchase uh, his little red book. And uh, they had uh, Chinese translations, which did me no, no good, but there was an English translation. And, and Mao Zedong said, women hold up half the world. What he was saying by that was half the world is made up of women. It's a, it's a pretty important recognition. And I believe historically if, if Christians had led the way in celebrating and blessing and esteeming women as the scripture acknowledges them and calls upon us as men to do, that there would, uh, there may still have been a feminist movement I, because it's, because the devil is very clever and he likes to, he likes to masquerade. But it would not have been seen as necessary in a society of daughters who were blessed and told you have value. I'm afraid sometimes too many Mother's Day sermons put an emphasis, and it's, it's a right emphasis, on women bearing children. The scripture speaks of that. But see, that leaves out women who have not born any children. I've told you about my, my aunt, Inez Fazel, never had a child in her whole adult experience, died in her 90s. But you see, when, when daughters are raised to think like this and to, to aspire to this, they become mothers whether they ever bear a child, adopt a child or not. I remember the conversation we had in Shreveport where Karen and I were visiting with, with a family, the Macaulay family. They were, they were homeschoolers, we were homeschoolers and they were a precious example. They had adopted, they, they, made a, they had their own biological children but they made a, a mission of adopting special needs Asian children, and then I think the last child they adopted was a special needs Russian child. We were talking to them one day, and she said something about being, uh, being from Arkadelphia, Arkansas, and I said, well, I have a, an aunt that lives in Arkadelphia, Arkansas, Inez Fazell, and she said, Miss Fazell is your aunt? I said, yes. She said, we, we grew up right down the street from her, and in fact, she took me in and in many ways was more of a mother to me 
than my own mother. And I found out, I began to, that that was, she worked in the, in the nursery, I think at, at Park Hill Baptist Church in Little Rock for a long time. And child after child who were now grown spoke of what a powerful influence she had in their lives. Why? It began with her as a daughter. It didn't sh just happen when she got married, and, and, and it doesn't just happen when, when you have a baby. Now, I will tell you, uh, having observed this several times, that, uh, that having a baby changes a lot of things. It even changes uh, some things about the way a woman thinks. I remember in seminary when Karen was the first one to become pregnant in our circle of friends, and I remember conversations by these ladies, they, and just as she was uh, drawing closer and closer to the time of delivery, and they, oh, that would just be so horrible. Oh, I, I can't imagine. Oh, my. Well, in the fullness of time, <laughs> they too were found with child, and attitudes changed. It, it does happen. It does happen. But what we're looking for is not necessarily the, the physiological, biological changes that take place in a woman when she is found to be with child and then moves toward the time of delivery. We're talking about something that be, must begin much earlier. We must speak to our daughters, bless our daughters, raise our daughters, love our daughters, encourage our daughters, repent to our daughters when we do not bless them and share with them how precious and valuable they are. May our daughters be like corner pillars. It's, it's really interesting. There's a, a, one of the writers in this that I read said, one would expect at first glance that the daughters of a household would be as the graceful ornament of the clustering foliage. In other words, that they would have been the ones referenced about a plant that is, that is full grown. And that the sons as cornerstones upholding the weight and burden of the building. And yet here it is reversed. And this ancient writer says, And I think one may read the love and tenderness of the Lord in this apparently casual but intended expression. That he, he meant the nations of the earth to know and understand how much of their happiness, their strength, and their security was dependent on the female children of a family. It has not been so considered in many a nation that knew not God. Exhibit A, Boko Haram, an, a Muslim expression of how they think their God would have them treat women and girls. It's not been known, he says. In polished Greece in times of old, and in some heathen nations even to this day, the female children of a family have been cruelly destroyed as adding to the burdens and diminishing the resources of a household. In other words, they just were too much trouble. The inscription, the, the letter found extant from a, from a Roman commander writing back to his wife. He was off in battle and said, I suppose by now you have delivered the child. If he is a son, take good care of him. If it was a daughter, kill her. Christianity. The worship of the true and living God brings women into focus in their precious place in the home and in society. He says, and sadly, even in some Christian countries, if the daughters have not been destroyed, they are with equal pitiless and remorseless cruelty cut off from all the solace and ties and endearments of life. In other words, what this writer was saying and what the, what the Bible shouts is that women were not made to be barefoot and pregnant and in the kitchen. They were made 
to raise every generation. And we know that well by experience. The hand that rocks the cradle rules the world is not just a clever saying. It is truth. That doesn't diminish the role of dads and moms in shaping sons. We'll talk about that in due time. But it does recognize, in other words, he's exactly right. We would have expected the, expected the images to be reversed. That the sons would be the corner pillars. And the daughters would be the flourishing plants. It would be a fitting image. But no. How contrary all this is to the loving purpose of our loving God, whose Holy Spirit has written for our learning in this text that sons and daughters are alike intended to be the ornament and grace, the happiness and blessing of every household. And you see the weight that that puts, young ladies, young ladies, our desire for you is what the scripture says should be our desire for you. We want our daughters, our granddaughters, to grow up recognizing that, that they play the role in this one image of the cornerstone pillars. What a powerful influence a godly woman can have on children. What a powerful influence a godly mother can have on children. So we celebrate Mother's Day not, not out of some, some obligation. We celebrate Mother's Day recognizing that there is incredible blessing in the reality of motherhood, of womanhood. One writer says, by daughters, families are united and connected to their mutual strength as the parts of a building are by the cornerstones. The next thing I want us to see is, may our daughters be like corner pillars cut. And when it's, it says cut, it's talking about being shaped. We have a responsibility to shape them. There was a, a book, uh, I think by Ray Ortland, published several years ago, Children Are Wet Cement. But what does wet cement do over time? It hardens. When do you do your easiest work? in shaping wet cement while it's wet. <laughs> Let it harden. You can shape it. But see, wet cement can be shaped with tools, even with hands. Hardened cement's got to be shaped with chisels. May they be cut, shaped, And sometimes we may feel like, well, we're not winning this battle. But let me tell you something. If you, to the glory of God, we talked about that this morning in, our, in the Bible study time with our men and boys. If you, to the glory of God, with a desire that I want to, I want to raise this little girl, this little bundle of joy, I want to raise her in such a way that it will be well-pleasing to God. If that is your goal, that is your desire, that is your commitment, that is your prayer, then you may not see the results very quickly because you, we all know parenting is not for cowards. But you must trust the Lord that if you raise up a child in the way that God would have him to go, by God's grace, that child, when taking of age, will not depart from the way of the Lord. There's no guarantees you're going to get exactly what you want in the raising of your daughter. But you must believe the Lord that if you raise your daughter in the nurture and admonition of the Lord, that one day the same strength and determination that may be used in rebellion will be that strength and determination that becomes the pillar, the cornerstone of a family. You see, we have the opportunity to raise daughters who will bless their husbands. May they be like corner pillars cut 
for the structure. There's a purpose. There's a purpose. We don't just live willy-nilly, loosey-goosey, uh, just taking the, the tides of life as they come, and cresting on the wave. There's a purpose for the structure. For something God is building. He's building his kingdom. Jesus Christ came and announced. We've seen it in the Gospel of Mark. Repent for the kingdom of God is near. And Jesus lived out the life he did in perfect obedience to God's law and he died the death he did. And he rose from the grave and just before he ascended he said, you whom I've made disciples, you make disciples whose hallmark will be living a life, learning, absorbing, putting into practice everything I've commanded you. There's a structure being built. And you know as well as I do. And I, I saw it in seminary so many times, I cringed. I saw some good men in seminary who were married, who married badly. And their wife would doom their ministries. By the same token, I saw men in seminary who were semi-competent, and I would see that when I looked in the mirror, by the way, whose wife adorned him, blessed him, it was exactly what he needed. Why was that? She was a daughter raised to be a pillar to fit the structure, finally, of a palace. And, and the Hebrew word here in the psalm, some, some say it, it's speaking specifically of a temple and that the image of a temple is better because a temple directly relates to the worship of God. God can be worshiped anywhere, palace, temple. But she is, she is, becomes a corner pillar, a cornerstone, because people have invested in her life to shape her and mold her, to, to expose her to positive influences and to remove her from negative influences. The shaping process. To expose her to the Word of God. Nearly every morning of the world, when our our little granddaughter who lives with us and our little grandson who is living with us for a season. It, when they get up for breakfast, nearly every morning of the world, Karen plays, bless the Lord, O oh my soul, O oh my soul, worship his holy name. They know it. Five years old, two years old, can sing it. To instill in them these kinds of thinking that life is to be lived blessing the Lord. Because you see, when, when you raise a daughter in such a way and pour into her the things of God and model for her the, the, the life of Christ who said, follow me, and we, can, and we can say to our daughters, follow me as I follow Christ, then, then they become strong components of a home in your home as they're growing up and then of their own home as they establish one under God. And any place where such a godly daughter dwells becomes a palace. Becomes a precious, it doesn't matter, you can, you can live in a, in a dirt hut, you can live in a mansion. And both of those become palaces if inhabited by a woman who has been shaped by the things of God, who knows her noble purpose is to glorify God by, by her life, living in livelihood.
We thank God. I'm privileged to know many women who model this very thing. The women in our congregation, by and large, are such women. They, you may not have known it, but this is exactly what God has done in your life. For you young women, it's exactly what God is doing in your life. Don't chafe against it. You say, well, Brother Bill, my, my parents aren't doing a very good job. Well, then pray for your parents. Pray, dear God, help my parents to be better parents to me. Help my parents to stay focused on pleasing you. And then you pray, little girls, young ladies. Oh, God, make me, make my life so evidently yours that my existence in my home as I'm growing up and in the home you will give me when I marry, that, that I will be a cornerstone. I will be a strength, a pillar, holding up the things of God. Lord, don't let me chafe when I am shaped, when I'm being shaped and cut according to your word for your glory. Let me yield to that and love that and embrace that and be thankful for that. And let me understand my purpose. And let me so live that wherever I live and labor, it will seem as a palace by the energies I expend. We want godly daughters. We thank God for, for godly women. We thank God for godly wives. We thank God for women who are, who are nurturing the next generation. What a blessing, as folks stood a while ago. The scripture says one of the blessings of God is that, that you will see your children's children. Now, you will live to see your grandchildren. And so when I hear someone speak of great-grandchildren, I'm thinking, you are super abundantly blessed. Look what God has done. He has let you live to see the third generation that you can pour into them. As you've poured into their mommies and their mommies. Raising godly daughters. It's one of the most important things we do. Even if you don't have children, you ought to see your place in assisting to raise godly daughters. It begins back in our nursery when those little baby girls are brought in back there. We ought to see our role. One of our roles is we have an opportunity to love them. They know when they're loved, to speak to them, to woo them. That early on, they hear voices speaking value into them. That they will grow up and not let men mistreat them. I want to close with this. I came across this in a link that someone sent me by a blogger. The American Girl, Princess to Promiscuous. Why our daughters are having sex. Just because you want to know the consequences to, to failing to raise godly daughters? When Katie was in kindergarten, she had her first boyfriend. Her mom thought it was so cute. When Katie was in sixth grade, she went to her first school dance with a boy. Her mom was giddy. She spent too much money on a dress and snapped too many pictures. When Katie was in seventh grade, she nervously kissed her first boy at a football game. Her mom thought, my little girl is growing up. When Katie was in eighth grade, she kissed her second and third boys. Her heart was broken for the first time. Her mom assured her that she may kiss a lot of toads, but one day she'll find her prince. When Katie was in the ninth grade, she started making out with boyfriend number five. One night when they were watching a movie in his basement, they went too far. She engaged in immorality with him. Didn't tell her mother. This is the story of the American girl. We scratch our heads and wonder why we have astronomical teen sex rates. We can't figure out why STDs are passed among high schoolers like the common cold. We wonder if handing out birth control pills and condoms will reduce unwanted pregnancies. Friends, we are the ones who have set this ball in motion. We've sent the message that boyfriends are cute. 
We've delighted in their first kiss. We have trained our daughters that their sexual purity is for sale to the first boy who says, I love you. Our daughters have traded their priceless virginity for nothing more than a cheap compliment from a horny teenage boy. And our God is disgusted by it. He says in Leviticus 19, 29, do not prostitute your daughter to cause her to be a prostitute lest the land fall to whoredom and the land become full of wickedness. God's disgusted, she says. We have a generation of lewd, raunchy, unholy children. What do we do now? She gives a prescriptive. We need to stop it, repent, if we started going down that pathway, stop thinking little kindergarten, kindergarten boyfriends are cute. Stop allowing our teens to, to be alone, giving them access to immorality. Stop putting our children in adult situations, expecting them to make wise, God-honoring decisions. We need, secondly, to protect our daughters from the wiles of the devil and boys who regurgitate his words from hell. Instill modesty and pure conversation. Dressing for sex, talking about sex leads to sex. Our daughters are the right treasures of the king of all kings. Treat them like it. Number three, nurture. Our text here today. Cultivate relationships at home. Make a home a happy place. A lot of girls run into the arms of a boy because it seems better than the mess at home. Fourth, feed her passion. If your daughter's boy crazy, expand her horizon. Find something she's good at, something her creator put in her heart. Maybe it's playing the piano, art, writing. Her heart will be full when her life is a song sung to her heavenly father. Finally, intend her for marriage. Speak highly of marriage. Let her see you live a good marriage. Purpose her to give herself to only one. Play an active role in sparing her from a broken heart. Marge sexuality and problems for her marriage in the future. Purpose her for marriage. Purpose her for holiness. We can give ourselves to raising godly daughters, or we can live with the consequences of failing to do that. I believe better of you than that. I'm thankful for the young ladies in our congregation. Long for the day when they rise up and take their place as pillars of strength and grace in what God is building. Let's pray.